Chapter Eight of The Last Trail. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Vendetti. MikeVendetti.com. The Last Trail by Zane Gray. Chapter Eight. Jack said, "Colonel Zane to his brother next morning. Today is Saturday, and all the men will be in. There was high jinks over at Metzer's place yesterday." and I'm looking for more today. The two fellows Alex Burnett told me about came on day before yesterday's boat. Sure enough, one's a lordly Englishman and the other the cussedest-looking little chap I ever saw. They started trouble immediately. The Englishman, his name is Mordaunt, hunted up the shepherds, and as near as I can make out from George's story, Helen spoke her mind very plainly. Mordaunt and Case that's his servant. Little cuss got drunk and raised hell down at Metzer's where they're staying. Rant and Williams are drinking hard, too, which is something unusual for Rant. They got chummy at once with the Englishman, who seems to have plenty of gold and is fond of gambling. This Mordaunt is a gentleman, or I never saw one. I feel sorry for him. He appears to be a ruined man. If he lasts a week out here, I'll be surprised. Case looks ugly as if he were spoiling to cut somebody. I want you to keep your eye peeled. The day may pass off, as many other days of drinking bouts have, without anything serious. And on the other hand, there's liable to be trouble. Jonathan's preparations were characteristic of the borderman. He laid aside his rifle, and, removing his short coat, buckled on a second belt containing a heavier tomahawk and knife than those he had been wearing. Then he put on his hunting frock or shirt, and wore it loose with the belts underneath, instead of on the outside. Unfastened, the frock was rather full, and gave him the appearance of a man unarmed and careless. Jonathan Zane was not so reckless as to court danger, nor, like many frontiersmen, fond of fighting for its own sake. Colonel Zane was commandant of the fort, and in a land where there was no law, tried to maintain semblance of it. For years he had kept thieves, renegades, and outlaws away from his little settlement. By dealing out stern justice, his word was law, and his bordermen executed it as such. Therefore Jonathan and Wetzel made it their duty to have a keen eye on all that was happening. They kept the colonel posted, and never interfered in any case without orders. The morning passed quietly. Jonathan strolled here or loitered there, but saw none of the roisters. He believed they were sleeping off the effects of their orgy, though in the previous evening. After dinner he smoked his pipe. Betty and Helen passed, and Helen smiled. It struck him suddenly that she had never looked at him in such a way before. There was meaning in that warm, radiant flash. A little sense of vexation, the source of which he did not understand, stirred in him against this girl. But with it came the realization that her white face and big dark eyes had risen before him often since the night before. He wished for the first time that he could understand women better. "'Everything quiet?' asked Colonel Zane, coming out on the steps. "'All quiet,' answered Jonathan. "'They'll open up later, I suspect. I'm going over to Shepherd's for a while, and later we'll drop into Metzer's. I'll make him haul in a yard or two. I don't like things I hear about his selling the youngsters rum. I'd like you to be within call.' The borderman strolled down the bluff and along the path which overhung the river. He disliked Metzer more than his brother suspected, and with more weighty reason than that of selling rum to miners. Jonathan threw himself at length on the ground and mused over the situation. We never had any peace in this settlement, and never will in our day. Ebb is hopeful and looks at the bright side, always expecting tomorrow will be different. What have the past sixteen years been? One long, bloody fight. And the next sixteen won't be any better. I make out that we'll have a mix-up soon. Metzer and Brandt, with their allies, whoever they are, will be in it. And if Bing Leggett's in the gang, we've got, as Wetzel said, a long, hard trail, which may be our last. More than that, there'll be trouble about this chain lightning girl. As Wetzel predicted, women make trouble anyways, and when they're winsome and pretty, 
they cause more. But if they're beautiful and fiery, bent on having their way, as this new lass is, all hell couldn't hold a candle to them. We don't need the Shawnees and Gritties and hoss thieves around this here settlement to stir up exciting times. Now we've got this dark-eyed lass, and yet any fool could see she's sweet and good and true as gold. Toward the middle of the afternoon, Jonathan sauntered in the direction of Metzer's Inn. It lay on the front of the bluff, with its main doors looking into the road. A long, one-story log structure with two doors answered as a barroom. The inn proper was a building more pretentious, and it joined the smaller one at its western end. Several horses were hitched outside, and two great oxen yoked to a cumbersome mud-crusted wagon stood patiently by. Jonathan bent his tall head as he entered the noisy barroom. The dingy place reeked with tobacco smoke and the fumes of vile liquor. It was crowded with men. The lawlessness of the time and place was evident. Gaunt, red-faced frontiersmen reeled to and fro across the sawdust floor. Hunters and fur traders, raftsmen and farmers, swelled the motley crew. Young men, honest-faced but flushed and wild with drink, hung over the bar. A group of sullen, visaged, serpent-eyed Indians held one corner. The black-bearded proprietor dealt out the rum. From beyond the barroom, through a door entering upon the back porch, came the rattling of dice. Jonathan crossed the barroom, apparently oblivious to the keen glance Metzer shot at him, and went out upon the porch. This also was crowded, but there was more room because of greater space. At one table sat some pioneers drinking and laughing. At another were three men playing with dice. Colonel Zane, Silas, and Shepard were among the lookers-on at the game. Jonathan joined them, and gazed at the gangsters. Brant he knew well enough. He had seen that set, wolfish expression in the riverman's face before. He observed, however, that the man had flushed cheeks and trembling hands, indications of hard drinking. The player sitting next to Brant was Williams, one of the garrison and a good-natured fellow but garrulous and wickedly disposed when drunk. The remaining player, Jonathan at once saw, was the Englishman, Mordaunt. He was a handsome man with fair skin and long, silken, blonde mustache. Heavy lines and purple shades under his blue eyes were die unmistakable stance of anticipation. Reckless, dissolute, bad as he looked, there yet clung something favorable about the man. Perhaps it was his cool, devil-may-care way as he pushed over gold piece after gold piece from the fast diminishing pile before him. His velvet frock and silken doublet had once been elegant, but were now sadly the worse for border roughing. Behind the Englishman's chair Jonathan saw a short man with a face resembling that of a jackal, the grizzled, stubbly beard, the protruding, vicious mouth the broad, flat nose, and deep-set, small, glittering eyes, made a bad impression on the observer. This man, Jonathan concluded, was the servant Case, who was so eager with his knife. The borderman made the reflection that, if knife-play was the little man's pastime, he was not likely to go short of sport in that vicinity. Colonel Zane attracted Jonathan's attention at this moment. The pioneers had vacated the other table and Silas and Shepard now sat by it. The colonel wanted his brother to join them. "'Here, Johnny, bring drinks,' he said to the serving boy. "'Tell Metzer who they're for.' Then, turning to Shepard, he continued, "'He keeps good whiskey, but few of these poor devils ever see it.' At the same time, Colonel Zane pressed his foot upon that of Jonathan's. The borderman understood that the signal was intended to call attention to Brant. The latter had leaned forward as Jonathan passed by to take a seat with his brother and said something in a low tone to Morant and Case. Jonathan knew by the way the Englishman and his man quickly glanced up at him that he had been the subject of the remark. Suddenly Williams jumped to his feet with an oath. "'I'm cleaned out,' he cried. "'Shall we play alone?' asked Brant of Mordaunt. "'As you like,' replied the Englishman, in a tone which showed he cared not a whit whether he played or not. "'I've got work to do. Let's have some more drinks and play another time,' said Brant. The liquor was served and drank. Brant pocketed his pile of Spanish and English gold and rose to his feet. He was a trifle unsteady, but not drunk. 
"'Will you gentlemen have a glass with me?' Mordaunt asked of Colonel Zane's party. "'Thank you. Some other time with pleasure. We have our drink now,' Colonel Zane said courteously. Meantime, Brant had been whispering in Case's ear. The little man laughed at something the riverman said. Then he shuffled from behind the table. He was short. His compact build gave promise of unusual strength and agility. "'What are you going to do now?' asked Morant, rising also. He looked hard at Case. Eh, "'Shiver me sides, Captain, if I don't need another drink,' replied the sailor. "'You've had enough. Come upstairs with me,' said Mordaunt. "'Easy with your hatch, Captain,' grinned Case. "'I want to drink with that there engine killer. I've had drinks with buccaneers and bad men all over the world, and I'm not going to miss this chance.' "'Come on, you will get in trouble. "'You must not annoy these gentlemen,' said Morant. "'Trouble is the name of my ship, and she's a trim, fast craft,' replied the man. His loud voice had put an end to the conversation. Men began to crowd in from the bar-room. Metzer himself came to see what had caused the excitement. The old man threw up his cap, whooped, and addressed himself to Jonathan. Engine killer bad man of the border will you drink with a jolly old tar from england suddenly a silence reigned like that in the depth of the forest to those who knew the borderman and few did not know him the invitation was nothing less than an insult but it did not appear to them as to him like a prearranged plot to provoke a fight well, you drink redskin hunter bawled the sailor no said jonathan in his quiet voice maybe you mean that against old england demanded case fiercely the borderman eyed him steadily inscrutable as to feeling or intent and was silent go out there and i'll see the color of your insides quicker than i'd take a drink hissed the sailor with his brick-red face distorted and hideous to look upon he pointed with a long bladed knife that no one had seen him draw to the green sward beyond the porch the borderman neither spoke nor relaxed a muscle oh ho oh, my brave pirate of the plains cried case and he leered with braggart sneer into the faces of jonathan and his companion it so happened that shepherd sat nearest to him and got full effect of the sailor's hot rum-soaked breath he arose with a pale face. "'Colonel, I can't stand this,' he said hastily. "'Let's get away from that drunken ruffian.' "'Who's a drunken ruffian?' yelled Case, more angry than ever. "'I'm not drunk, but I'm going to be, and cut some of you white-livered border mates. Here, you old masthead, drink this to my health, damn you!' The ruffian had seized a tumbler of liquor from the table and held it toward Shepard while he brandished his long knife. White as snow, Shepard backed against the wall, but did not take the drink. The sailor had the floor. No one save him spoke a word. The action had been so rapid that there had hardly been time. Colonel Zane and Silas were as quiet and tense as the bordermen. "'Drink!' hoarsely cried the sailor, advancing his knife toward Shepard's body. On the sharp point, all but pressed against the old man, a bright object twinkled through the air. It struck Case's wrist, knocked the knife from his fingers, and, bounding against the wall, fell upon the floor. It was a tomahawk. The borderman sprang over the table like a huge catamount, and with movement equally quick, knocked Case with a crash against the wall, closed on him before he could move a hand, and flung him like a sack of meal over the bluff. The tension relieved, some of the crowd laughed. Others looked over the embankment to see how Case had fared, and others remarked for some reason he had gotten off better than they expected. The borderman remained silent. He leaned against a post with broad breast gently heaving, but his eyes sparkled as they watched Brant, Williams, Morant, and Metzer. The Englishman alone spoke. Handily done, he said, cool and suave. Sir, yours is an iron hand i apologize for this unpleasant affair my man is quarrelsome when under the influence of liquor 
Metzer, a word with you, cried Colonel Zane curtly. Come inside, Colonel, said the innkeeper, plainly ill at ease. No, listen here. I'll speak to the point. You've got to stop running this kind of a place. No words now. You've got to stop. Understand? You know as well as I, perhaps better, the character of your so-called inn. You'll get but one more chance. Well, Colonel, this is a free country, growled Metzer. I can't help these fellers coming here looking for blood. I runs an honest place. The men want to drink and gamble. What's law here? What can you do? You know me, Metzer, Colonel Zane said grimly. I don't waste words. To hell with law, so you say? I can say that, too. Remember the next drunken boy I see, or shady deal, or gambling spree. Out you go, for good. Metzer lowered his shaggy head and left the porch. Brant and his friends, with serious faces, withdrew into the barroom. The borderman walked around the corner of the inn, and up the lane. The colonel, with Silas and Shepard, followed in more leisurely fashion. At a shout from someone, they turned to see a dusty, bloody figure with ragged clothes stagger up from the bluff. "'There's that blamed sailor now,' said Shepard. "'He's a tough nut. My, what a knock on the head Jonathan gave him. Strikes me, too, that Tomahawk came almost at the right time to save me a whole skin.' I was furious, but not all that alarmed, rejoined Colonel Zane. I wondered what made you so quiet. I was waiting. Jonathan never acts until the right moment, and then, well, you saw him. The little villain deserved killing. I could have shot him with pleasure. Do you know, Shepard, Jonathan's aversion to shedding blood is a singular thing. He'd never kill the worst kind of a white man until driven to it. That's commendable. How about Wetzel? "'Well, Lou is different,' replied Colonel Zane, with a shudder. "'If I told him to take an axe and clean out Metzer's place, "'God, what a wreck he'd make of it. "'Maybe I'll have to tell him, and if I do, "'you'll see something you can never forget.'" End of chapter 8